Okay. Video. Maybe you join Settling in. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. I have the music was playing. <laughs> if you guys would like to just mute yourselves um, at this moment, that would be great. Okay. So, all right, I think I'm going to start. Um, and as people come in, um, Sabina would let them in but I wanna start on time. So welcome everybody, good evening. Um, thank you so much for joining Ken Memorial Library's Books and Beyond event. As you know, I'm Pinky Shah uh, and I'll be hosting this evening along with Sabina. Um, I would like to remind everyone, please mute. <laughs> um, and this will be an interactive uh, session. So at the end, you will have a chance to ask questions to Gabrielle. So please feel free to raise your hand or type your question in a chat or me or um, so, uh, so me and Sabina would be happy to ask it for you. And just as a reminder, this um, tonight's uh, event is going to be recorded. So if just letting you know, so you, down the road, if you guys do want to revisit, you have something. Um, and after the discussion, we will be raffling two copies of um, signed book by Gabrielle uh, live, so stick around. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Gabrielle Glasser. Um, uh, Gabrielle uh, Glasser is the author of most recently American Baby, A Mother, A Child and the Shadow History of Adoption, which tells a shocking truth about post-war adoption in America. Earlier this year, the book was featured on the cover of New York Times book review and CBS Sunday Morning. She has covered the intersection of health, medicine, and culture for the New York Times and many other publications, including the Daily Beast, the Washington Post, Glamour, and Scientific American, and is the mother of three grown daughters. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for joining us tonight. Welcome to Ken Memorial Library's Books and Beyond event. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be with you all. Thank you. And I love your background. I know you said you are sitting outside. I am. I am. I'm at the I'm at on vacation this week at the beach and um, we're in a little apartment that and this seemed like a, a nicer background than. Yes. No, than, thank you so much. Attention. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your vacation and joining us. We appreciate that. Of course. Um, so, uh, Gabrielle, when uh, this book actually was recommended to me by Sabina, she's an avid reader, <laughs> and she could not stop talking about it. She was blown away by it. Uh, and when I started reading this book, I was equally uh, blown away by the, the harsh reality of the adoption world. Um, I guess if you are not exposed to those type of circumstances, you are oblivious to what's even happening in that corner of the world. Um, and the story that you told, a uh, story of adoption world that you told through David and Margaret, can you please talk a little bit more about how you ended up choosing that family to tell the story? Well, that's a great question. Thank you very much for that. Um, this, the family found me in, in many ways because I first met David Rosenberg as a newspaper reporter in Portland, Oregon in 2007. He was an adopted man who was getting a kidney donation from a friend. And I met him for the first time at a dialysis center. I pulled out my notebook to start beginning to take notes and before I even had my pen out, he said, I hope this story goes viral and I hope my birth mother sees it and recognizes me as her son. He wanted, as he put it then, to find more medical information, not only for himself, but for his, his three children. And it was impossible to meet David Rosenberg and not become his friend. He was a gregarious, larger than life, 
man on this planet. And when he did ultimately reunite with Margaret seven years later, the, the story did not go viral in 2007 as he had hoped, but ultimately um, he took a DNA test, as you know, and reunited with Margaret seven years later. And he called me to tell me that he had found his birth mother. And he was so overjoyed. I could feel that peace in his voice he had always believed that he had been given up, that he had been an inconvenience to his birth mother. And when he learned that his birth parents had married, that they'd had three more children, that Margaret had searched for him and done everything she could in her teenage power to try to keep custody of her son, it reversed a narrative for him that he had believed all of his life. And that first conversation that we had when he called me, uh, uh, would have been four months, like four or five months before he died. I heard it very different, David. And in that sense, the story found, the story found me. And he did ask me, he said, would you please write about the secrecy laws that have kept me and so many other adoptees apart from their birth families? So I didn't take that lightly. I didn't take that request lightly. So. You sure did, and, and I'm sure so many people uh, were touched by it, and I'm sure they are very grateful that this came out. So thank you so much for um, bringing light um, on this, this harsh reality and the subject that was kind of hidden. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Initially, I, w I knew that this story was a powerful narrative between a mother and her son, and the background of the families was fascinating to me and the background of the Jewish adoption agency, which had deceived everyone involved. That was shocking to me. And I initially, to be, to be honest, I thought it was, wow, this is a really interesting story about these two families. I didn't know that it was going to involve an entire nationwide system. I didn't know that there would be we don't really know the number of people who were adopted in the years, in the decades after the war, because the government stopped tracking it, but it is at least 3.5, 3.7, possibly even 4 million um, sons and daughters who were separated from their, their birth mothers. That's a lot of people. A lot of people, a lot of, people, a lot of family. Um, like if you look at the, just the original parents, and then adopt you. So like, if you add all that, that's right. so many pe people got affected by just one step off. Right. That. So, so uh, and that's, that's a staggering amount of number. So what, why do you think, was that a um, religious aspect or uh, the mindset or the lack of uh, sex education or, not easily available birth control. What, what do you think played, what are your thoughts? What played the, this big of a role in this whole like scenario? Well, in the years after the war, American society was deeply, deeply conservative. People, women had been um, contributors in the war effort. They were making planes, they were working in canneries, they were driving trucks. And after the war, and also during World War II and during the depression, there were so, the birth rate was very, very low. Once the, the, the war was over and the economy was flourishing, there was an enormous demand on women to go back to the hearth and to start procreating. And at the same time, that was what married couples were supposed to be doing. And they were doing it, fueling the demographic, the largest demographic wave in US history, which was the baby boom. But behind the scenes with no sex education, no birth control until Griswold versus Connecticut for married people in, in, in 1965, um, an illegal abortion, a lot of young girls were getting pregnant too. They had more space than ever before. They had more freedoms than ever before. Many uh, uh, girls and boys were had suburban homes with rec rooms and the backseat of the family Bu Buick in which they could explore their sexuality. And 
they did. And as we know, about 4 million young women got pregnant. And society was so, again, so conservative, so uh, um, unforgiving of anything that was outside the conservative norm, that those girls were just sent away out of sight. And their problem of an unexpected pregnancy was the answer to, to the, the, the desires of many couples who were unable to join the baby boom because they were infertile. So these, the, there was a, a, a transaction that on the face of it was positioned as a very tidy one. Here, we're gonna take your baby, give it to a, a married couple who wants to start a family and no questions asked. Uh, we have this secrecy system that, that um, certainly existed nationwide, as you know, in 48 states that sealed away the original birth certificate of, an, of a child who'd been surrendered for adoption and then gave that child an amended birth certificate with his new name and the names of his adoptive mother and father as his, as the, his original parents. That sealed the door very firmly between the birth family and the adoptive family. And it really, and people just had this idea, well, nobody's ever gonna look, nobody's ever gonna be curious. Why would they, why would they? And as I'm sure you know, Connecticut only earlier this summer voted to, I believe it was in May, voted to open, to give adopt, Connecticut adoptees, adult men and women access to their original birth certificates. So it's a slow, painstaking state-by-state -state process. Well, just to what you just talked about, like um, burden, guilt, shame, all those negative emotions of being pregnant is always felt more by women or is, is that the society thing or we take on us? I don't know, but they were the one who got punished. They were the one who were sent um, to uh, these places where they had to live in certain circumstances and go through the birth and not even getting to hold their newborn while you know the men out there who were equally part of this were I not being affected. Absolutely. And that is something that to me was, was also shocking. How these women were shamed, humiliated. They were treated like criminals. And in fact, in New York State, it was actually a crime to have sex as a minor, have premarital sex as a minor. So as you know, um, and maybe we'll get to this uh, a little bit later, Margaret did everything she could to maintain custody of her son. She fought and fought and fought and fought. And ultimately the last straw was the social worker who threatened her with juvenile detention. She was a month away from becoming a legal adult in New York state. She was 17 years and 11 months old. And the, the, she refused to sign, refused to sign, refused to sign, had this idea, this fantasy that she would be able to, to um, get custody of her baby. And ultimately it was the law, not only the shame, not only the humiliation, but the threat of the law for putting her away in juvenile detention that finally she had, the only choice was no choice. And she signed because she certainly didn't want to go to a reformatory school. So. Uh, and do you think this whole thing uh, by agency was like uh, taking a uh, advantage of what's happening as uh, girls are getting pregnant and on the other side the demand of unfertile pair i mean well, because there are a set of parents who cannot have babies and this there was an opportunity for agencies to look at this unfortunate event that's happening for both sides as a business absolutely absolutely and everybody was taken advantage of the girls who were shamed and humiliated and cut off from their sons and daughters, some in many cases who still are, and then the adoptive parents who were desperate to try to start families, 
were also taken advantage of. They had to pay a great deal of money to, main, to be able to stay on the uh, wait lists at, at all of these adoption agencies nationwide. It wasn't just the one that I featured in, in Manhattan, the Louise Wise uh, agency, all agencies, Catholic charities, uh, um, some of the bigger ones. There was a place called The Cradle that catered to celebrities just outside of Chicago. And if you wanted to get on the waiting list, you had to pony up and you had to pay for a lot of, a lot of things behind this growing business that was actually using at its center children for commerce. It's really painful to say that, but that's the truth. And, and do you think because law and government and or some big people are involved in this whole operation, if uh, you are not on either side of party, either giving birth or receiving a newborn, were people even aware of that this world exists? I think so few people had any understanding of what was happening behind closed doors. They were unaware of the testing that was going on, uh, 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 on experimentation that was going on on newborns. They knew, adoptive parents knew that the babies were being tested. They thought they were being given intelligence tests. That's why they were typically kept in um, foster care for at least, at least three to six months. But, and we'll get to that in a minute, but I, I, I would be hard pressed to say that any adoptive parent was, was fully aware of what was going on behind closed doors. And, and to the, in today's day and age, social worker are kind of, if some, you know, they have a role. Do you think back then in that era do they exist it? Do or do they have any role to play in the safety of a child? In the safety of a child, that's a really good question. The social workers were very involved. In there were social workers who were assigned to the girls, and there were social workers who were assigned to adoptive parents. And in some cases, the social workers would choose. In all cases, the social workers would choose which baby went to which parent which set of parents. And so I do believe that they were, I, 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 I interviewed several dozen of social workers who had been, who worked in adoption during that post-war period, maybe a little later, late sixties, early seventies. And one of them was very bold. And she said, we, we were in love with the power we had. We felt like we were on the admissions team at Harvard we could decide who got to become parents. And it was a very heady experience. So yeah, they're not, uh, uh, I think many of them were truly did believe and, and understood that the road for a young woman to have a baby by herself without support would have been exceedingly difficult, if not impossible in the post-war era but many of them, I, 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 I've heard from several who have, and again, that, that's anecdotal, I've heard from several who have told me, you know, I, I have great remorse for what I told those girls. I told them that they would forget this child and they would be able to move on. I'm a mother myself. I wouldn't, this is what one woman told me. I'm a mother myself. I knew that was a bold, a, just an absolute outright lie. And it was, and it was, but... It yeah. was what she needed to do to get the process moving. And, and, and in the book, you talk about what lie the birth mother was told about where their kid is going and also adoptive parents, where the child is came from. I can't hear you. Um, the whole op operation was in a way, it just, it started with a lie. It's keeping everybody, uh, you know, under, nobody knew the truth. They kind of created the new stories, which was like, a, when you write your own story, obviously it's going to be all 
you know, you're going to write everything good about it. And that's what they were doing by telling that, oh, this is the mom of mom it has this quality, dad has this quality. It's like a designer baby kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly, Pinky. It was as if, oh, we're gonna, going to, in Margaret's case, for example, they positioned her as if she were an aspiring physician. You know, this kid came from such a smart woman. She, the, the father is a, a um, is in his is his father's family business and um margaret is a gifted scientist who goes to this prestigious science high school none of that was true none of it was true and likewise as you know they told her he's going to a diplomat this week also a lie he was in he languished in foster care he was rejected by one family after 11 days when he was about eight months old and then returned to foster care and ultimately placed with the Rosenbergs who were lovely people who cherished him, worshiped him, adored him, gave him every advantage, but they weren't diplomats. They were humble. Ephraim Rosenberg was a humble clergyman, terribly gifted, beautifully renowned, a voice that could just chill, your, chill you to the bone with its beauty, but he wasn't a diplomat. So they made everybody, they put everybody on paper. They made everybody sound like, as you said, a, a, a supermodel, a supermodel who was also a genius. I mean, no, that doesn't exist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but that's, that, again, that's like a, the way they were running their business. And I think people, right. well, one of the person you just mentioned, when to them, it was just a job, even though they knew they are lying. Right. Uh, day and night they are lying and they are telling uh, this uh, fabricated uh, stories to both sides. Uh, and they were doing it as a job and moving on with the life while the mother who has just given up their child, they, right. it, they never can get over that tra uh, traumatic situation that they just put under. Um, right. And of... Um, Another thing, like uh, in the library, what I came across, as I said, that when people started to picking up the book and talking about this, a couple of people also mentioned um, that either they or they knew somebody that back during that time in the home act, if you have taken home science, correct me if I'm wrong, if you have taken home science, they were taking care of these babies they were in they were in like for them that was a class they were taking exactly to take care of these babies they were passing them around as if they were dolls sorry sorry <laughs> i don't know what to do it's okay it's over. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Sorry for the ambient noise. I thought it was, it started out being really quiet and it sort of picked up. So I do apologize for that. Okay. Um. Uh, oh, about the home ec women. Yes. yes. 50 universities developed those practice homes from upstate New York, Cornell, through throughout the United States, land grant colleges that had home ec programs used those babies. They had them on loan from adoption agencies where, and taught the girls how to mother. And without any regard for what was happening to the emotional development of the child. And I came across some records in, at Oregon State University that had big giant ledgers full of beautifully um, uh, um, penned, notes that would tell you how much cream spinach a baby had how much what their preference was for pears over peaches how much formula they had just down to the to the to the spoonful to the half ounce of what these babies consumed with no mention whatsoever of what the emotional impact of passing a child from woman to from girl to girl to girl to girl. In some of these places, the, the, the practice mothers changed hourly. In some cases, they are, there was a shift. 
um, you know, maybe you have the night shift, you have the day shift. In some cases, it was a weekly thing where you had your week with the same baby and then you graduated and the baby went on to another, another college student. It's shocking. It's, it's an really experiment, shocking. like science experiment. Exactly. Keep notes exactly. On, you do yeah, the, you no, know, it's like it's like you know when you have a science experiment with your kids, and it's high school, and you've I have three kids, and by the time the third one comes, it's, it's like oh okay, let's try to do, you know, have you thought of this experiment? But that's exactly what you're you know that's exactly what what you're talking about, Pinky. You sit at the kitchen table, you go through the process with your child. Okay, here's what you do if you do X. Here's what will happen if, if you add Y. Let's let's think about that. Nobody was, these, these babies were passed around like footballs. They were passed around like human dolls it's as an experiment. Another piece, of just it's on the same note you have in your book is if how long they cry and how they react that was kind of the measurement of their intellect uh, intellect yes that was certainly one of the most shocking things that i discovered in that one of the board members of the louise wise agency that was at the center of this book and also the same agency that separated identical twins and triplets this there was a pediatrician on the board of of, of the Louise Weiss of Louise Weiss services who believed that the babies who cried the loudest were the most intelligent. So how to measure that and how to measure that in a 10 minute old infant. And he was the one, his name was Samuel Karolitz and he came up with this horrendous, sinister, diabolical looking rubber band gun that was about this big. And it shot very forcefully, it shot thick rubber bands, the kind that you would have around a big pile of mail at the sole of a 10 minute old infant's foot. And he and his researchers would then measure the cries of the babies. And the babies who wailed the loudest and the longest were deemed the brightest. And those were the babies who were then matched with doctors and lawyers, people who had higher levels of education. If babies didn't cry very much, they would be assigned to a postal worker or a, a low level bureaucrat, somebody lower down on the totem pole of the waiting list at Louise Wise Services. It's really shocking to think about that that study, they were called induced crying studies. They were funded by the United States government for more than 15 years. And those studies, they're, Anybody with $34 can go to ResearchGate and download them. There were a dozen, at least, of those of, of induced crying studies in very high profile journals and nobody was hiding. Wow. They were, it, it was called induced crying. Here's what we're doing. Here's our, here's our methodology. We're making these, we're, we're, we're inflicting pain on 10 minute old infants who have been separated from their birth mothers and will likely never see them again. Uh, do you, in your research, have you come across, because horrendous crime also happened during Holocaust when, when they were doing this, this very heartbreaking researches on kids. Right. And there were cases against them were brought up on humanity. Do you know anything that happened to these people uh, who d came, did something like that? That is such a great question. Thank you for asking it. As far as I know, there were no lawsuits ever brought to those people for that experiment. But it was, I found out about it through a tip through some adoptee rights activists who came to me and said, we want you to know about this. A birth mother had uncovered it. A birth mother who had been in New York had uncovered it herself. One in trying to search for her son, she had befriended several former social workers who told her about this experiment. That birth mother then told 
adoptee rights activists who reached out to me. And by the time I learned of it, those studies were 50 plus years old and everybody associated with them except one researcher was dead. I actually did track down one of the, 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 the investigators in those studies. She was in Florida. Her name is listed on them, on the, on the, 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 the studies, the, the published peer reviewed journals. And I called her and said that I wanted to talk to her about the physician in charge, Samuel Karolitz. And she said, oh, I've got a lot to tell about him. You know, me too. Well, he was, he me too'd me. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you want to know. So I flew down to see her. And by the time I, I, I entered her office, she was, she had completely lawyered up. She didn't remember anything about the studies. I said, well, that's interesting. Dr. Haber, her name was Haber. I'm not talking out of school because her name was listed. Dr. Haber, that's so interesting. The studies were called induced crying. Did it escape your attention that that's what was, oh, I just crunched the numbers. I just crunched the numbers. I was a young PhD. I was a woman in science. This was, I, I needed a job. It was rare to, to be able to get a job in those days as a young woman in science. All that is true, but it didn't escape my notice that she had a rubber band ball on her desk and she was tossing it from one hand to the next the whole time I was in her office, which I thought was really odd. We didn't put her in the book in the end because the book had so many villains already. It seemed like villain overload. So, but it is a great question, Pinky. Thank you. I do know that some people have, have hoped to bring charges, but Louise Wise is bankrupt and there's no way to know which child now an, an adult was subjected to those because the documentation was destroyed. Uh, this is this is this is so too much. This um, continuously, I have chills. Um, uh, now, do you know like open adoption versus closed? I feel like nothing's perfect. And I'm, I'm not the one to judge if I'm not in the situation. I have no right to uh, say good or bad about anything. But in your research, if you have come across uh, talking to people, do you see people leaning towards one more than the other? Certainly open adoption is, is by far the rule in the United States today, but it is not always... It, it sounds like it, it's certainly um, a long way away, a far cry from these closed adoptions that I write, wrote about in, in the book, but the system remains quite corrupt and there is a great deal of fraud and fraudulent promises that are made to birth mothers with adoptive parents saying, yes, of course, we'll have open, open and ongoing contact with you and you'll be able to know about your child's development. And sometimes that family moves and the birth mother never hears from the, the family again. Mm -hmm. Or the birth mother pledges to be a part of the child's life and because of her own grief and trauma, she disappears. So, the research, it's very important to note that the research shows that open adoptions, at least on paper, are far more, um, less traumatic. They're still traumatic. Adoption is a rupture and it, adoption begins with loss and for the adoptee and for the birth parents. And it's important to, it's a painful truth, but it's important to note that no matter how cherished and loved a child is, to be separated from your birth kin is traumatic. And what the data show are that it is far more, it creates less anxiety, depression uh, on, for both the birth mother and the adoptee, but it's still difficult. 
it's not a panacea. And you said it with, with your first sentence. It's not, you know, it's not perfect, but it's better. It's better than 55 years of not knowing who your, who your birth mother was, who, what the circumstances of your birth were, or for that matter, the fate of your son or daughter. And just the feeling of that I was given away, mm -hmm. um, and not knowing the circumstances, I, I cannot even imagine what it does to you. Uh, in that case, like David came to closure that all his life he was wanted and he somewhat was able to die peacefully knowing that. Exactly. Versus, he, you know, so... For an adoptee in an open adoption, sometimes it's still painful because you might be able to see your mother, your birth mother, at one time a year. And there's always the question. This is what the research shows. The question is, why, why, why was I given away? Why was I rejected? Why it might not be conscious, it might not be constant, but it certainly um, is there. At least in an open adoption, though, an adoptee can integrate the circumstances of his or her birth with the reality of his adoptive family's life. There was a very famous adoptee, a writer by the name of Betty Jean Lifton, who wrote a book about her search for her mother and what she called the ghost kingdom that adoptees, I wish I had known this when I wrote the book, I, 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 it, it escaped my attention at the time. Um, adoptees often create a fantasy world that they that is called the ghost kingdom in their minds. Well, I wonder if that's my mother. I wonder if that's my father. That person looks like me. Could that be my sister? I wonder, did I come, what were the, uh, do I come from nobility? Do I come from poverty? Where do I? What were the what were the circumstances of, of my of my story? Yeah. Um, I just um, I have a question from one of our listeners. Could the adoption agreement be changed so that if a birth hold on, <laughs> it disappeared? Uh, um, sorry, could the adoption agreement be changed so that if a birth mother originally thought she would want the procedure to be closed? Could the, I missed a word there. Could the, could the it, Ado adoption agreement be changed so that if a birth mother originally thought she would want the procedure to be closed. So you, I, I, what I'm understanding is you start with open, but then you change your mind and now you- Oh, want I see. Oh, I, you know, adoption is completely unregulated and in almost every state. And there, in, in some states in open adoptions, there are um, post adoption contract agreements that are supposed to dictate the, the, the regularity of visits and, and so, so forth, but they're rarely enforceable. But maybe the, I'm wondering if the question also was that adoption, many women went through life believing, all right, I'm never gonna see my child again. And they constructed new lives where they held this secret and that they, you know, some women don't want to be found. They don't want their families, their new families, their husbands to ever have known this dark secret. But I come out on the side of Connecticut legislators here, a birth mother, an adoptee has no choice in the matter of how they came into the world. And I believe that it is a human and civil right for them to be able to access their original identity and to be able to, to learn their origin story, to learn who they came from. Even if the birth mother does not want contact, the adoptee, I believe, is owed the explanation of where he or she comes from. I hope that makes sense. I hope that answered the question. Uh, uh, to me, yes, it did. Uh, and on that note, I would like to now open it up to everybody, um, because otherwise I know I can keep talking on this subject. 